online attendees, and we want them to be able to hear us as well. And Sam's going to be helping us with manage that to our colleagues. Sam. So we are going to ask you, um, the ones in the room, to, to maybe go around and introduce yourself. Um, and then, if Sam, if you, I don't know how many people you have online, maybe you can figure that out. But um, if you could give us your name, department, a quick word on what you were hoping to get from the day, what you're interested in when it comes to research data management. My name is Purvi. I'm uh, a graduate student in the history department. And I really want to learn how to organize all the research parties. Hi, Sam Sayden. I'm with the Office of Research and Engagement, Launching with CG. So I'll be uh, working towards the commercialization of IP. So this is very interesting for us to see how, as a, as a whole, it's going to be put together. I'm Elvis Foley. I'm a second year master's student in kinesiology. And I'm here to basically learn how to manage my data for my thesis project more efficiently. So the one thing we, I'll point out is that on our slides, there is a bit.ly link that will take you to the slides. Um, so if you want to um, write that, jot that down, um, we will also send that out at the end as um, part of the uh, recording and all of that. Um, there's also some more materials that we have that we may not get to today um, that we'll send out with the recordings, including the handout. And things like that. So um, our objectives today, uh, first, we usually, in these sessions, have a, a variety of people. So we have somebody from history, somebody from kinesiology. Um, online, we have science librarian. We have different kinds of um, perspectives. Oh, did you want to, did they share out who they are? OK. OK, awesome. So one of the things we're going to talk about is talk, uh, recognizing what research data management entails, what that actually means, um, and why it's important. Uh, we'll identify some common data management issues. And we're using the word, I'll talk about this a little bit more, but we're using the word data very broadly here. Um, and then some best practices as well as resources. Um, those resources will be a little bit more geared towards quantitative data. Um, but uh, Anna's session, or section of the session, will get into some of the file practices and file management data um, as well. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Deborah is our diversity resident uh, librarian um, in the library, so she's here. OK. Um, and it, 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 this is obviously informal, so we'll pause for questions from the online audience. And then if you all you have questions as well, let us know. Anna, this is yours. So one thing I wanted to acknowledge very early in this talk is that uh, research data takes many forms. The life cycle of research takes many forms. And this is just a small snippet of what you see when you do a Google image search for research data life cycle. So those of you in the room who are doing research, your research process may not be depicted here. The people who are supporting others' research, your, the processes of the people who are you, you are supporting, they may not be exactly depicted here. But um, we are hopefully going to be covering areas that will be relevant to everyone. We just want to acknowledge that research takes many forms. It uh, gathers different types of data, and it has different products at the end. So we're here to talk about um, and touch on as many of those as we can to help those of you who are doing different types of research. <laughs> Um, so first of all, we'll talk about the why and the what of research data management. Um, when it comes to the definition of research data, we're talking about any types of information that is collected, observed, or created for the purposes of analysis for original research. So that, in that sense, it can, it can include the traditional kind of quantitative things that we are gathering. But as well, in addition to that, includes the, the contextualizing, like the other kinds of uh, documents such as Word documents, um, PDFs uh, in history, definitely collecting lots of PDFs, um, laboratory notebooks, questionnaires, transcripts, code books, um, all different kinds of files that lead into the research project that you're doing. Um, so the traditional 
approaches is the observational, experimental, and the simulation derived or compiled. So operate, ob observational data are data that are captured in real time. Um, so sensor data, survey data, things that are, very, that are that's the more quantitative aspect of things. Um, experimental data, um, this is data that's acquired from lab, from lab equipment. Um, uh, and it can be re reproducible, but it's very expensive to reproduce <laughs> if you have uh, experimental data going on. Um, simulation data, this is uh, data generated from test models or other kinds of models. Um, and then derived or compiled data are uh, data such as 3D modeling, um, compiled database, text mining, like that. So it's a wide range of data uh, that we're including within this, um, this, this idea of data management. All right. um, so why data management? Um, these are some of the things that you can imagine happening or have happened to you um, from natural disasters, which is probably the most extreme, hasn't happened to many of us, to just um, the things that do happen more often, such as loss of, loss of staffing competencies. Um, so if you work in a team and you lose the one person who has the knowledge of a particular database or a knowledge of um, the organization of the files, Changes in user expectations is also a big one. Changes in what um, people are wanting both from you um, as a data provider or changes in what you would want data. So I've had a, have a project ongoing where I, I've changed what I actually want to collect and then process. <laughs> and so it changes the data. And so that can be a problem. Um, more often, we're looking at human error. Um, and that, that can hit us in different ways. So have any of you um, had data loss? Sure. <laughs> what was your data loss? Oh, that's a big part of it. I've had um, students, this is again history, students who've had to go and recreate their PDFs from archival research. We've had um, examples of people who, um, you know, a drive that wasn't well organized and nobody understood what that drive was in your situation. Um, I had an external drive one time just corrupt for no reason, <laughs> right? So those are all things that can definitely happen to us and the reason why we talk about it. Um, so there's also reasons beyond the, the natural disaster aspect of it or the disaster um, planning. Managing and sharing data can increase the invisibility Increase the visibility and impact of your research. Um, it promotes innovation and potential new data uses. So my role as a social science data librarian is to help connect people with secondary data. Um, and so if you have a data set that you're collected, you may not always know how people might use it in the future. There's a ways of using that data. Um, so we try to think as forward into the future as we can. Um, it could lead to collaborations that are unexpected. Um, it increases uh, uh, transparency and accountability. Um, encourages validation of research methods. Um, this is something that uh, several institutions are doing, looking at re re results reproducible and whether or not you can the results that have gotten out of their research. Um, it also saves time, helps to preserve your data, and finally, it is required <laughs> by some funding agencies, most funding agencies. So what we're going to do is go through and talk about um, some of the issues that the U.S. Office of Research Integrity has identified as the major issues in data management. And these are the, the ones that we'll look at. So these are seven issues. Um, lack of responsibility or defined roles, lack of a DMP, poor records management, lack of metadata in a data dictionary, um, not backing up or, or having other kinds of security issues, undetermined ownership and retention, and a long-term plan. Um, so we'll go through each of these briefly and talk about best practices for each of these. Um, the one we'll focus most on, though, is going to be records management and metadata, because I think because those are the ones where the library really can't help um, you with that. Um, and there are, again, this is not just the, like the library can do all of this. This is an interdepartmental effort. Um, so it may be the IRB, or it may be the Office of Research Integrity, it may be us that can um, help you with and some are IT issues as well. Um, so the first one is the lack of responsibility. Um, 
And this is a major issue when it comes to team science, to working with teams. And so one of the things that the, they, they had noted is the, that researchers aren't defining roles very well when it comes to their teams, what people are going to do on the team. Um, so what they suggest is, first off, to define roles and then responsibilities, um, and focusing on roles and not on individuals is the key part of this. So rather than a person comes to you and they have particular skills, they set out what it is, the skills that you need, find the people who fit in those particular skills. Um, so for example, if you need somebody who has experience with metadata or data dictionary, creating di dictionaries, um, looking, or sorry, if you have a, a need for somebody who um, has experience with metadata, looking for somebody who can fit that role rather than just working with the people that are available to you. Um, we'll talk more about, about what a data management plan is in a bit, but definitely identifying um, skills needed for each task in the data management plan. And do any of you have experience with data management plans? Do you, okay. do you have experience? Okay. We'll talk about what they are and kind of look at one maybe in a little bit. Um, so data management plans uh, are plans for managing your data through the research process. That's the basic version of that. Um, but one of the things that we need to think about is how do we identify the skills that are necessary for each of those parts of the data. Um, and then developing training plans for continuity. This is something I think that we don't spend enough time doing in figuring out how do we train our people, um, especially if we have um, the possibility that one person can leave the university and you need to train them. So that's a, a big part of this. The next thing is the lack of a data management. So not actually having this. So what is a data management plan? Um, I'm going to, this is a brief version of this. We do a whole training session just on the data management plan. Um, but I'm just going to go briefly over what this is. Um, first off, it's a formal written document that will outlines what you will do with your data during, before, during, and after your research. So the whole process of doing the research project. And it helps to ensure that your data are safe for immediate reuse, use and reuse in the future. So the idea is you're documenting not just what your research pro project is, but how you will manage the data through the process of doing the research. Um, it is required, by, like I said, by a lot of uh, agencies now. Um, and these are the major components of uh, data management plan. So the first one is look, information about the data and the data formats you're creating. So in your case, Pervy, it would be PDFs, right? You're mostly working with PDFs. OK. OK, awesome. Yeah, so look, you're thinking about all the package of things that you would create or that you're going to be um, collecting together. What kinds of data files do you? Okay. Do you uh, all kinds? <laughs> okay. And so that's thinking through the different formats that you have, and we call it, a way to think of this is a data inventory. Do an inventory of all the different formats that you are collecting. Um, So the way, most of the time what we think about when we, in the way we approach it would be the, the file format. So is it a PDF? Is it Excel? And the reason why that's important in the file format rather than the type of information is, is because you need to know whether or not it, it's a proprietary format. Right? So in the case of Excel files, make sure that your Excel files are then saved as CBS files in some way so that you have a non-proprietary format. Right? You can use it across different software systems. PDFs are, pri are not uh, as much of a problem as other kinds of formats. Um, another way to think about this is saving your files. If you have a lot of Word documents, saving them as PDFs, not just as Word documents. Um, we ha don't have as many problems as we used to back in the day with, uh, with um, backwards compatibility. So the fact that you couldn't open a, uh, you can't open a Microsoft, I'm trying to think of works as a file in Microsoft Word. My, I'll get my example of this, I, my thesis was in a Microsoft Word file. Um, and in order to get an editable copy, I had to convert it to Microsoft Word, which is not very easy to do. Um, 
So making sure that you're you're keeping up with that kind of versioning. Um, the, again, with those kinds of files, it's not as big a deal, but where we see a lot of problems with people who are using proprietary software or proprietary um, instrument collect data collection with their instruments, and they're not saving it in non-proprietary. So in other words, they need to have that particular software or that particular instrument to be able to read the data in the future. And that's where it becomes a bit of a So knowing what your data are, what kind of format they're in, is key for being able to then um, use them in the future. Um, in some cases, uh, you know, libraries might have or archives might have some of the, the you know, either, for instance, if you have your data on a zip drive, uh, number zip drive, you have your data on a zip drive, we might have the, the equipment to be able to process that and put it into a new format, um, but we're not going to have all the equipment that we have for collecting data. So um, that requires that you do some of that legwork so that you know that your data will be non proprietary. Does that make sense? Um, and there, again, there's more information about all of these, so we'll have a lot more for you. And the second one is metadata content and format. That's what Anna's going to talk about mostly in a second. Um, third is policies for access sharing and reuse. So if you have uh, a requirement that you need to have your data accessible and usable by other people, um, if you need to share your data, make sure that, that pol those policies are acknowledged in the data management plan. Um, Long-term preservation, so you know, saving your data for the long term is not a, uh, a free process. <laughs> it's something that requires thinking about the drives that you have and whether or not they will be stable in the long term. Or if you're planning to archive your data, typically there's a cost involved to archive data. So for um, us, we use a lot of our social science researchers who want to use ICPSR, which is a a large inter, the Inter University Consortium for Political and Social Research. It's a large data archive, um, but there's a cost for having your data fully archived um, at archives. And almost all of them, there's going to be some kind of uh, cost to it. And the final part of that is the budgetary consideration. So again, thinking about if you need to hire a data management planner, if you need to um, buy external drive, right, if you need to um, archive your data in a a large archive, thinking through the budgetary considerations for those. So these are the, the, the five components that we talk about a lot. Um, and as you can see, these are some of the funding agencies um, and what they require in their data management plans. And you can see that it matches up with a lot of those things. Not all of them have exactly the same thing, um, but uh, NSF is the one that has the most complete when it comes to their data management plans and what they expect do, um, but even NIH, even though they have um, not necessarily the data inventory, they do have uh, expected to see provisions for protection, policy for use, access and sharing. So when it comes to data management best practices, um, try to think, again, in the life terms of the life cycle of the data. So what are you collecting at the beginning? What format are you then converting it into for the processing? How, what, how is your data kind of moving through that process of um, doing your research? And certainly, you are always welcome to ask for help um, if you want to think through some of those collection processes. Librarians are really good at organizing data and organizing information, um, so we're happy to sit down and talk to you about the organizational plan that you have, um, the research plan that you have, even if it's not a data management plan for funding the community. Um, there are several guides, both uh, a guide I'll show you later, as well as many others on doing this process. So there's plenty of resources out there to give you guidance. And then finally, there's one called uh, a tool. If you are writing a, a data management plan for a granting agency, um, a grant uh, funding agency, there is a tool called the NC tool, which helps provide those support. Have you used it? Did you find it useful? Or? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Great, fantastic. Yeah, and I think that's the key. Yeah, the key, that's the key. With, so it provides a template of each major funding agency's data management plan and what they expect to see in the data management plan. Um, so it goes through the questions. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, that's great. And we will um, uh, look at data management plans from the library's perspective, not from the obviously from the researcher's perspective, but if 
um, people want us to look at them um, for the long-term preservation, long-term archiving aspects of the state entrance. Do that. Happy to do that. Um, all right. So the third one we'll go into is poor records management. And I'm going to hand off to Anna. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So records management, this is kind of a basic thing, but it's important. And these are the types of issues that we're talking about when we're thinking about records management. So labeling or titling, what do you call your files? Like this is a very basic thing, but it can be very important, especially if somebody else comes into a project, for them to understand the organizational structure of the data and be able to find things. Um, so can those titles let you or others know what those files are, recognize and understand why they might be important, what they might be used for? Versioning of your data. Are there multiple versions? How do you know which one is the most recent? Are they structured, in, whether it's in paper or electronic, are they structured in a way that it can help people find them? Is your data in a lab notebook, on a USB drive, um, a personal laptop? Where is it? Um, and is it backed up? Is it located? Is, is it in full location? Do you have it at home? Do you have it in the office um, on the shelf next to the hot plate with the frayed wires? Do you have it on your USB keychain that you carry with you when you go kayaking? Like, is this is an actual? I'm, I <laughs> that's the real life, not my data. <laughs> but another person. Um, after a kayak trip said, oh yeah, this has like all of these dissertations from back up of my university and was like, oh my god, what are you doing? <laughs> um, but thinking about is it in multiple locations where it will be safe? Um, and then the format, which Linda has mentioned, is it a format that's proprietary, that's going to be able to be read in the future? So these are some issues that people run into. So this is just for fun. Um, can you find the file in here that has the newest clean data for your PI who is looking for the file with the newest clean data? I will give you the answer. No, <laughs> you cannot. Um, based on the structure or lack of structure here, there's no way to know just by looking at this what is going on, if there is anything like there's no there's no um, scheme here, so they're not this. We would have to open up some of these files, try to figure out what's going on, maybe try to rename them. Um, so this is the sort of thing we want to try to help avoid. So some best practices for file naming: date designations can be really helpful. Starting off with a date and whatever you choose, being consistent with that choice. Shorter file names are often better. Um, some things may be dictated by the system that you're using. And in that case, um, go with what your system is telling you if you don't have a choice. Uh, but when you do have a choice, thinking about preferring perhaps shorter file names if they're able, if that's able to give you the information that you need, avoiding some characters that cannot be read in file titles in some systems, leaving zeros can help you keep things in sequence. Some software will not recognize file names that contain spaces, so it's good to avoid those. And there are some options on here to show you um, how you might avoid spaces, but still um, keep that same information in the same order. Um, so information for file names. Consistency is really important. Choosing a scheme and sticking with it. Um, and that can help you identify your files just by looking at them and help others as well if you're working in a team. And these are just some ideas, some possibilities for things that you might want to include or base um, include in those file names um, related to your project, coordinates, researchers, dates, the type of the data, the condition, the version number. So it's really going to depend on the needs of your specific project. These are just some things to think about. And including a readme file in the directory can really help either remind you or um, your collaborators uh, about any abbreviations or codes or anything like that. So we've got another folder structure here. And we've got some acronyms. 
but we also have a README document. We're looking for the file, any file that my PI needs. We open this README. It tells me we're working on the file naming project. And it has two sub-projects. Both of them have acronyms that are described there, explained. We have three study sites. Each of those has an acronym. And it tells us what the file naming conventions are for this project. So the file names include four components the sub-project code, the location of the study site, that acronym, a date, and the initials of the researcher. So there's an example there. And that includes BDIS, which is the Bad Data Improvement Survey, UUL, our study site at the UNCG University Libraries, a date, and the initials of the researcher. So if my PI needs the most recent file from the Bad Data Improvement Survey study site at the UNCG University Libraries, I can find that code for this project um, and then for that location. And then the dates are kept in order. And I can see that that most recent one is 2018, November 15. So this might not be a perfect match for the sort of thing that you're doing. But did you have a question? So November 30th is at a different site, that one at the bottom. So So we're looking, we are looking specifically in this case for the, UU, the most recent UUL one. And this one is at a different location. So it is more recent, but it's at a different site. So it is not the one that the data is looking for, or that the um, PI is looking for in this case. Yeah, the date modified. Well, in this case, it's not helpful because I made up all of these at the same time um, as an example. But the date modified might or might not be when it was actually, I mean, it might be on that date. It might not. Somebody may have gone in to edit something. Um, there, so that, yeah, it's just a little dicey. You want to, um, from our perspective, having it in the file name so it's part of the file is the most important thing. Not that you, that you don't want to rely on the equipment or the software that's telling you and the data is. It really needs to stand alone in terms of that information. Yeah. yeah, if I'm making a copy of these, say I'm translating these from Excel files into CSV, like Linda mentioned earlier, and say I'm doing all of that like on the same day as a batch, then all of my date modifieds are going to look kind of like this. They're going to be all the same. And it's not going to have any relation necessarily to the date that the data was collected. So having that date information in your file name, if that is important to your project, uh, can be very helpful. If you need help doing a batch rename of your files, there are some utilities out there, some programs that may be able to help you. And these are a couple of them. They are linked uh, in the slides. So if you're looking for help renaming a lot of files at once, these might be some things to check out. Metadata and data dictionary. So first, I want to make clear the idea of data versus metadata. So this is my cat, Bootsy. And say I have a lot of photos of him. That is accurate. Um, <laughs> That is, let's say, my data set here. All of my data is all of these photos of Bootsy. The metadata is going to be what helps me find a specific photo or what helps me manipulate this data set as a group. So I don't actually have 14,000 photos of him, but I'm sure that by, um, give me a few more years, <laughs> we will get there. So say my data set is 14,000 photos of Bootsy. My metadata is the information about each of those files. Titles, the date the photo was taken, what's the name of the file, the type of the file, the size, maybe geographic coordinates, subjects that might be attached to it, if there's a photographer name, usage rates, things like that. So information about those individual files. So then here is one file and data that might be associated with that. So a title, a date that it was taken, the file name, it's a JPEG photograph, the size of it, it was taken in Greensboro, some subjects, the name of the photographer, and then usage rights. These are just some examples of metadata fields. And the metadata might be very different for whatever your data set is. So say you've got a data set of 
70 terabytes of Mockingbird calls. It would, might be very important for you to know where those specific calls were recorded, um, but also like how long, how big those file, um, those recordings are. So there would be different information that would be important about those data files depending on um, what your project is and what your file types are. So a few questions for y'all. And those of you online, also feel free to chime in in the chat. Anyone have any thoughts on a correct data format on this list? Yes. G, I like that one. That's a great one. Definitely a personal favorite. Others, another, someone for G. A is also a good one. Um, OK, so this is a tricky one because your documentation, if you are working from a certain system, can help inform these decisions. So on this slide, we've got two different systems that I work with with metadata. And one of them requires month, day, year dates. Another one requires year, month, day, and a couple of other codes. So these are library specific. Y'all probably won't be using these specific ones. but documentation in your profession that you have created in your own lab, that is really what you want to be working from. And it may be something that you have to create from scratch for your particular project, but it would be important to be consistent with that, to select a format that makes sense, and then to move forward using that format. Another question for y'all. What do you call this creature? Any ideas? Just those names. Groundhog? Definitely. Does anybody call this something else? Woodchuck? Chubby? Yes. OK. Small round creature. So there are a lot of potential names for this. Groundhog, but how is it spelled? Is there a space? Is it one word? It's scientific name, woodchuck. In some parts of the country, it's called a whistle pig, a ground squirrel. A specific groundhog that lives somewhere in Pennsylvania is Punxsutawney Phil. So the reason that I'm asking this is that my documentation in libraries for doing subjects is very specific about what we would call this. And it includes, so the, that 150 code means that that is the one that you use. The others are cross-references. So depending on, I mean, say you are capturing data about animals in a certain environment, it would be important that your group, your team, is calling things the same thing, or that that data is cleaned up to include the same information. So you don't have, like, 15 people calling it a woodchuck 14 people calling it a groundhog, and those aren't captured as separate things. Yeah? Just an, an example, we have been working with um, the Guilford County, and they have the 911 calls that people make. Um, and, and the system isn't always set up to be consistent in terms of how people are labeling Greensboro. So it might be GSO, sometimes GS, sometimes, right, right so that not necessarily, in some it, most cases, we might do a three-letter code or a two-letter code, but it's inconsistent in how people are, were labeling it in that data. And so that was a situation where we, they needed some consistency so that if somebody looking at the data, they could figure out what that code actually meant. So just another example. Thank you. That's a slightly more professional example yeah. than my woodchuck. Um, <laughs> but thank you, yes. Um, being consistent, I think, is the point here that having your team know what the words, what the codes are, and then implementing them so that the data is consistent and can be used by lots of people. Does anyone see any problems with this list? Yes. So we've got some differences in either direct or indirect order. You've got names that are starting with surnames. You've got names that are starting with first names. You also have a mix of corporate names and personal names. 
that might or might not be a problem. You've got some different forms of names. So I, is like Pete Wrigley and Peter Wrigley, are they the same person? Is Teddy Forsman, I assume, the same as Theodore Teddy L. Forsman? So we have different formats here, possibly for the same people. And if we are calling our data creators different names for the same person, that is going to affect people being able to find and use that data in the future and being able to co-locate uh, creator, the same creator who might be under different names. So again, my point here is consistency. And if there's a, say, controlled vocabulary or maybe making one at the beginning of this person is named X, we know he's a creator, we will be using this form of his name to title or to label all of the things that he created. So some best practices for metadata. Your metadata is going to describe the contents of your data files. It might explain the format for dates, time, coordinates, other parameters. It should define any codes that are used. So Linda was just saying, like, GSO versus GS, selecting a code, saying what it is, GSO equals Greensboro. Um, if there are values that are missing, Maybe not all values have to be filled in. So if some of them are only used in certain cases, your metadata data dictionary would explain that. And if you're using standard metadata schemes, or if your field has standard metadata schemes, you may want to consider using those. If you're not sure, the library your liaison may be able to help you. So data dictionaries, this is one um, one example I like on thinking about creating a data dictionary. So thinking about what does the field mean, how should it be used, this would be not just for you, but potentially for your team. Thinking about where the data comes from, how is it collected, is it going to be updated, does it stay static, if it's going to go somewhere else, be used in another system, what is that? Um, what should the field look like? The data, is it formatted in a certain way? Like, do there need to be leading zeros if there's a number? Is it a first name, last name, or last name, first name kind of situation? Are there any caveats to keep in mind? And then if there's a place to go for more information, where is that place? Here's an example from UVA of one metadata entry about trees that explains some of the, um, the columns of the metadata fields and what might go in them. So it's got codes for your site, K equals Catawba Forest, and a bunch of others. Your species field will have a scientific name. They're specific that they want a the scientific name up to a certain number of characters. Dates, things I don't understand. Um, but the point is that the people who are working with this data set understand these have trained their group, are working with their group, um, and they would know what to do with all of these things. And then the units and format in that column on the right, how is this data going to be recorded? Is it going to be plain text? Is it going to be a, a date format, a number, etc.? cetera? Mm -hmm. Going to the, to the date issue, um, you can see that the year, month, day, format. That is standard in social sciences to do the year, month, day, and I think a lot of in the sciences. Um, the tricky part is Excel cannot always handle that format <laughs> very well. And it, uh, going converting from one format to another, from Excel to another format, can be really problematic when it comes to dates. And so um, that's one of the reasons why Excel has some issues um, that we need to be mindful of, um, uh, be just because that is the standard way of doing dates for some fields. Like, Good point. Thank you. If your data is going to be moved from one system to another one, you want to be sure to definitely look at it to make sure that whatever is exporting your data is um, doing so in a way that makes sense in the new system. So this is a data dictionary, just a snippet of one that we use for a project in the libraries. And it's got some pretty basic information. About the ones on the far left are the metadata columns. Um, it's being moved actually between systems in this. That may not be clear. Actually, that doesn't really matter. So is the field required? 
in red, that top one, is a required field. This one, publication, is only a recommended field. So you might not have anything in that field. Um, the DC map piece is mapping between one metadata scheme and another one. What is the format of this data? These are three text boxes in this case. Is formatting allowed? So are you allowed to use HTML or any style tags? Some of these fields you are and some you aren't. Is it the data in there repeatable? So in some cases, no. You can only have one title, um, but you can have more than one publication. And then examples of what that data might look like and any notes about that. So your data dictionary may not look anything like this, but this is one that was useful for us with a particular project. Any questions at this point? All right. Definitely feel free to jump in if you have them. OK. Linda, I will hand this back over to you. So the next point that they make is about um, data files and backing up data files and security measures. Um, and um, one of the things that we've done and that others places have done is to ask their professors, their faculty, about their practices when it comes to data storage. <laughs> Um, and you can see here, this is the result of the survey. I, I would never do a pie chart in this case. I don't promote this kind of use of a pie chart. But <laughs> they didn't do pie charts. Um, you can see where people are storing their data. So what do you see is the, the, where potentially a large number of people are storing their data? Yeah, so. Yeah, no, I know. It's a terrible, terrible pie chart, but um, but it's, it does prove a point, which is this is what we also saw when we did the survey of our faculty as well. A large number of them were saving their data on a USB drive, potentially as a backup, because you could choose multiple, the assumption is you could choose multiple of these, hopefully. So hopefully this is the backup, and hopefully this is the network accessible storage is, is the main place that they were serving, uh, saving it. Um, but we are worried about this a little bit, right, that it's just on the hard drives. And we know that there's some people who have had their data just on their hard drives um, and not necessarily backed it up in other formats. Um, so this is something, again, we see um, in the variety of places people are, are saving as well can be a, a bit of a problem sometimes, too, um, just in terms of being able to find the data and get it out and make it shareable for other people eventually later. Network accessible storage, so we don't, we have that here at UNCG to some extent. Um, back a couple years ago, a year ago, um, when you logged into a computer on campus, you got a, a drive that was your drive. It, was, it had your name on it. And so you, you still have that? OK. Some people do? OK. Um, now we move to Box, so more, more people are, they're encouraging people to use Box instead of network accessible storage. Um, but the um, that's a really common thing. You see that it's in a university where you log in and you would have some kind of a bit of storage of some sort. The nice thing about Box is that it's considered to be pretty much um, you, that you can access it anywhere, but also that you could um, you, you don't have a limit on how much you can put into it theoretically. <laughs> they would probably start smacking it down if you did put too much in there, but. Um. Yeah, yeah, and so that's one of the big consideration we have, especially with master students and PhD master students especially, right, is the fact that they use their Google Drive or they use Box, right, but that you have to make sure that you are connected to your own so that you can then access it later when you've left the university because it does go away after a certain amount of time. Um, so the key questions for this um, is how often you should back, how often data should be backed up, how many copies you should have, where can you store your files, um, who is doing the backup and, and on what schedule. Um, so we recommend three copies of your data. Um, the original, which might be on the hard drive. An external, um, which would be local, so that might be an external drive. And then an external remote, which would be the cloud. And that's what 
standard is recommended that you have three backup points. Now, the one thing is, is Box and Dropbox, those kinds of things, they will they store in the cloud, and then they also store the local copy if you enable it. Um, but just making sure you have an additional copy somewhere else that is separate from that interaction is very important. If you don't like the cloud, that's fine. But I think um, the, the way we did this before the cloud was having external drives somewhere else, just actually physically out of maybe your house in a bank deposit or <laughs> in somebody else's house. Um, so uh, just making sure that there are those two copies. And external drives, um, I prefer external drives to USBs. USBs are notoriously problematic. Um, I've destroyed I don't know how many of them, so do not just save your stuff on Y'all are nodding your heads, which is good, but I have had many students show me their uh, USB drive with their dissertation. Um, the, so, and that, that relates to the next one, is just having them just geographically distributed, so local versus remote. So thinking through that process, if you don't like the cloud, then thinking of how you would you make a remote copy, something that would be off, off of your computer um, and outside of the same spot as your computer. Um, and then we prefer for storing data, encrypted and uncompressed data. Um, the, if you do need to compress, I encourage you to do it with your third backup copy and not your main data. We've had people compress their, their main data and end up um, having some corruption in the file and are not being able to open it. Um, so if you are going to encrypt, make sure it is a third copy or a different copy, not the main file that you're encrypting. Um, in some cases, some data management plans, you are required to think through these kinds of like, encryption issues and how you would protect the data while it's being processed. Um, but most students or most, um, most of our students would not run into that kind of problem necessarily. Um, this one is undetermined ownership and retention. So the problem here um, is that it isn't clear who owns the data. And it isn't clear how long to retain the data. Um, so the question then becomes, well, what is the intellectual property policy? Um, what is the IRB data retention policy? So what is the policy of the university? What is the funder's policies? What is your publisher's policies, if you have a publisher? And what are the federal and state laws surrounding your data? Um, in most cases for graduate students, this would be in, in a conversation with your faculty members about that. And this may or may not impact everyone here. Um, but definitely, if you are collecting data that's part of a funded um, project, you have to have some kind of uh, statement when it comes to who owns and how long you can retain your data, or how long you should retain your data. Um, this might not be something that we can always advise on, but certainly the IRB or um, your other people on campus could advise on these things. I'm going to jump in on here. Um, and then the final one is a lack of a long-term plan for the data. Um, so after the project ends, um, what will the formats be in? Will they be open source or open um, formats? Or are they going to be some kind of proprietary format? Uh, is there a particular software package that's required to read and work with a file? If there is, um, who will have access to it and how will they access that? Um, do you, you have multiple? files comprising the data file structures. So if there are files that are linked in some ways, um, that needs to be specified in the metadata so people can use the database in the same way that, that you are using it. Um, and then the last year, just getting into that non-proprietary um, aspect as well. Preferably ASCII formatted files <laughs> for um, quantitative data, but that's not always realistic and that requires a little bit of work. Um, so we tend to focus on CSV files for the for the future. All right. So this part, we're going to pause, and um, we're going to go into some tools that are out there. Um, and then we also, at the end, um, which we might be able to do, have uh, an example situation where um, a team is working on some data, and we're going to talk through some of the issues that they're running into. Um, so some of the tools, um, first off, the DMP tool is a big one. Uh, this is it provides templates for the major funding agencies, uh, NSF, IMLS, um, for their data management plan. So you go, when you log in, you can see how a data management plan should be structured for that particular funding agency. Um, this is not going to be as relevant for, for history, but for, for the social sciences, sciences certainly this is a, a big, uh, helpful tool. 
Another one that we promote is um, Open Science Framework. Um, have you all used Open Science Framework? So Open Science Framework is a platform. And you can actually go in and look at other people's data as well. Um, so it's, a, it's meant to be kind of a common. Have you used it yet? So it's meant to be a common, yeah, can we use it for the project? <laughs> a commons area where you can go in and collaborators can share files through Open Science Framework. You can also share, um, it allows you to embed widgets such as um, a Zotero widget or a Figshare widget or a GitHub widget um, into the, the, in the framework, um, into the interface, so that everybody can see the same files. And then the nice thing about this, it does help with versioning because it, it provides some information on each of the, the data formats that you're uploading to this. Yeah. One thing I like about it is that it allows attribution for like individual components of projects, so you can see who touched what and who did what. Um, which for big projects, you know, if it's a large group involved, sometimes you want to know not just like who messed with it or who updated it, but for attribution purposes. Well, um, I think I might have. Um, so you can, I would encourage you to play around with this. I know psychology uses this a lot. Um, you can actually search for uh, data in here or, or projects. Um, but you can see. Uh, the, you can see here. Um, the projects that are associated with this particular, or the files that are associated with this particular project um, allows you to, and you can make this so that it is um, only accessible to your team members, or you can make it public. And because it's usually finished projects, people will make public um, so that people can see what's going on in this particular project and all of the different files that are associated with that project. Um, so it's a really nice tool for, uh, again, for teams. Um, but. Uh, We've also seen people using it for conferences, so sharing the files from conferences and other kinds of things. Um, NC Docs and data. So NC Docs is our institutional repository for, and Anna, do you want to talk about NC Docs a little bit? <laughs> so are any of y'all familiar with NC Docs in the room? It stands for the North Carolina Digital Online collection of knowledge and scholarship, which is a mouthful. Um, it is our institutional repository for faculty and student scholarship. Most of the discovery through this is through Google. So most people are not coming to this website, which is not the fanciest website. Most people are finding papers and other things that are in there through Google. And it is generally for finished scholarly products, like articles that we've gotten copyright clearance for, people who want to um, share articles, presentation slides, other things like that. Theses and dissertations from students also go in NC Docs. Um, so this is one of our reference librarians who has a profile in there. She has a little bit of information about herself. And then a couple of her publications are included. The reason that we're talking about this, well, I guess we should be mentioning this also in the context of as you are finishing your product projects and writing articles and things like that, and CDOCs might be a place for you to consider sharing that finished scholarship. However, also, we have a new partnership with the Odom Dataverse at UNC Chapel Hill to support research data through NC Docs. And Jenny, um, our example here, is one of the people who has a data set in there. So with most of the things that are in here, they're going to be complete full text scholarship like articles, our um, exception is data. And in this case, we've got a little bit of information about the data, who are the authors, an abstract about it. And then we've got the DOI, the link to the data in there. Um, and when we click through, we go to Dataverse, a system specifically for working with data. This is at it's hosted at UNC Chapel Hill. Dataverse is a project that I think started out of Harvard. There are various Dataverses hosted at places around the country, possibly around the world. This one is at Chapel Hill. Um, and we offer this primarily for like statistical type data, for storing and sharing that. It would not be the right place for my 14,000 photos of Bootsy or anyone's like 
terabytes of Mockingbird data. <laughs> yes, if, if I wanted to share, if I analyzed my 14,000 photos of Bootsy and shared that data as like a CSV or whatever, I might want to put that in here. So the purpose here is to allow for sharing data sets, versions of data sets that might be associated with your published articles and other projects that you're working on. So if this is the sort of thing that you need assistance with, it is not the archive, as I said, for all data sets, but uh, we can also help provide options for other archives that might work for your specific situations if you're looking for a place to share your data. This works really in tandem with a with OSF, right? So if you have your ongoing files linked into OSF, the project files in OSF hit um, password protected, not shared, and then you once you're done with the project and you have the final data set or final um, uh, SPSS file or R file, then you can put those here for people to access. And this would be the where you're sharing those files. Well, and Graduate students, it's a little bit different process. So if you're asking about for NC Docs and posting like research papers on there, yes, if you have published work in journals, we would be glad to work with you to set up a profile for you. Um, right, no, so it's not, yes, your theses and dissertations do go in here, other class papers, there are situations where it might be appropriate to add those, but um, generally, no. These are for, this is for published, peer-reviewed scholarship, generally. Um, so if you are interested in having a profile like this, um, get in touch with Linda or with me. Linda will direct you to, um, to me or my colleagues, and we can talk more about that. And if you're interested in sharing data um, through Dataverse, uh, one thing, so you'll see that one of these little files in here has that red lock on it. That is only accessible to collaborators. These other two are publicly available. So there are options in Dataverse if you just want to set up your own. Um, anybody can do this in the UNC Dataverse. Um, and it can be restricted to users that are in your research group or it can be public. We would not recommend this, though. Definitely, definitely not for any kind of personal health information, any kind of data that is going to be um, per personally identifiable. So even if this is, even if they've got locks on them, we still would not want this to be used for any kind of personally identifiable data. The, um, yeah, so if it's something that health information, student information, anything that's subject to FERPA or HIPAA, this is not the appropriate archive for that. And the, the, just the last note on this, um, for if you are, as a master's student, you're going to be writing your thesis. If you do want to archive, if you have data sets and you want to archive it, this along with your thesis, you can do that. And I think you would be in a situation where you might want to do that. Um, Anna definitely and I can help you um, in those terms if that's something you want to do. Um, so the last, these are just some of the uh, guides that are out there. There's the UNCG um, data management guide, which has a lot of these links on it. Um, so I encourage you to, to, when you have time, to go back and look at it. Um, University of Michigan, University of Minnesota have really good guides that I always point people to. Um, ICPSR, is, I mentioned them at one point. They are the um, major, um, sorry, the major social sciences archives. So if you did have um, uh, data with personal inf identifiable information in it that you wanted to share in some way, these would be the people we would refer you to to talk through the process of anonymizing the data, making it so that it could be, um, or restricting the data to, restrict, making the data restricted access only um, within the archive. This kind of archive has a cost. It would cost, it's, I think the amount is usually around $800, 500 to $800 for that kind of um, archiving. And the reason why is because they go through and look at the quality of data, do a bit of data curation, as well as talk to you about other issues with the data. But they do provide um, information on creating data management plans, more resources, um, as well as uh, very willing to answer any questions if, you, if this is something that people are interested in doing later on. Um, 
one of the things I always tell people about, because I, I think this is a great book, but um, Data Management for Researchers is a um, relatively recent book uh, on this issue. And it's written, Kristen Briney is a librarian who was a, I think she was an oceanographer, I can't remember exactly, but she was a scientist who became a librarian. And this is an amazingly helpful book. It's also a decent read. Um, I read it in the summer, one summer. Like, oh. But um, uh, it's really good thinking about project, not just numeric data, but projects and how, you know, writing a book, how you might manage the, the process of gathering your files and working with your files as you go through that. Um, I use this to help me. I was on a project where we had 24 co-authors, and I used it to help me think through that plan for dealing with all of those co-authors um, as they were bringing in their file or sending in their files. Um, so it's, a, it's an excellent book, and I encourage you to look at it. We have it as an e-book, so it's easy to read. And she is a great, she's a, somebody you can contact as well and is happy to answer questions about um, data management. And then just a few other things, um, some other links uh, are there for you. And the f any questions or comments, issues that you run into? Yeah. <laughs> I No, here at UNCG, they encourage people to use Box, right? And the thing with Box, too, is that it um, the level of security decreases as you share it. So if you make it accessible on your desktop, it decreases the security on it. So what preferably um, UNCG wants researchers to do is use Box, not share to the uh, Box file, not share to your desktop. So for any kind of, of data that you are concerned about, definitely use Box and um, I would suggest not sharing it with your desktop. Yeah, and connecting with whatever the uh, box sync is what it's called. Now, for um, for something that is personally identifiable, there are other issues there with that kind of data, um, and that in many cases, if you are using data from ICPSR, they would say you cannot use a networked computer, um, and that requires working with IT at ITS to help you with that process. Um, in most of those cases, so if you go through ICPSR and get a restricted data file, um, you have to give the data management plan how you're going to manage the data while you're using it. Um, and it, it does say those things that you have to do in order to keep that data confidential and protected. Any other questions or comments? Do you want to try? So we have a, um, the last thing we're going to do is we have a scenario, and I think we're going to try this. So, so Sam, do you want to share that with them? Or maybe? No, the the it's the Google Doc that I sent in the original email. No, I think that's the yeah, sure, that's it. <laughs> that sounds good. So this is a um data management scenario. Um, and it's a, it's not, may not be in your field, so it may take a couple of go-throughs to read. Um, but it's an interesting scenario. And then what we have is a sample data management plan, which goes through all of the issues that we talked about. Um, and what I think it would make sense is if you could take a minute to read the scenario, and then um, look at the question. And what I'm going to do, I think makes sense is for maybe Deborah, if you could do, no, probably if you could do types of data, that's number one. Types, yeah. If you could do number two, sorry, if you could do number three, sorry. number three, sorry, four, and then the rest we might, uh, say, uh, say Amanda and that might be. And what, I, what we want you to do is look for both how they're doing well and how they're doing not so well when it comes to that particular question. And then we can talk about these.
Okay. Um, so